This episode is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, the easiest way to play season-long fantasy football. Underdog Fantasy sets your perfect lineup at the end of each week, so no management and no Tuesday nights on the waiver wire. All you do is the most fun part, draft the best team and win cold, hard cash. Play now at underdogfantasy.com and they'll match your first deposit up to $100 if you use code SPOTIFY. Empire. Hello, welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Con Report wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, like button, subscribe button. You can find us there at Empire Media. That's A M P I R E. Always, always, always much appreciated because I know. You have choices, so I thank you for choosing this show. So today, I'm going to be joined by former Washington tight end and now analyst Logan Paulson. We're going to dive into the season, talk a lot about the. We're going to talk a little bit about the Jaguars, but also a little bit about the, the playing the first game. What's that like for a player? Also, Carson Wentz in the offense. Where does Logan Paulson still have questions about this team, and why he's optimistic about? The defense. Yes, we'll get into all that. Now, before I get there, a couple things that you need to know. Let's start with the injuries. And Wednesdays are the day we get the full injury report. And Ron Rivera has made it clear he doesn't want to give out injury information until we get to the time where he has to. And that means it's Wednesday before the game. So what we know going into Wednesday is this. Tight end Logan Thomas said, He's not still sure if he's going to play Sunday or not. I've told you before, and he said this again earlier in the week, that it would be week two at the latest that he would suit up. Still wearing the brace on his on his left knee that he tore the ACL. So that's still obviously an issue. But he says he feels pretty good, and he hasn't ruled it out. So we'll learn more about that today. He has been practicing. He's been running. He looks pretty good. So that's a good sign. Um, We'll know more again on Wednesday. Cole Turner told me last week that he was going to play. He felt like he was healthy the week before. They still kind of took it slow with him to make sure, but he feels really good about where he's at right now. So that's a good sign for them. Then, as I'm sure you know, Cam Curl showed up with a a cast on his wrist dealing with a thumb injury, which required surgery. He, too, is not sure what it means yet for Sunday. He did not. He has not practiced with this on. Um, we've seen guys practice with with the protective padding on, on a cast. It's not a big cast, only a little bit up to the, on the wrist. Um, a lot of it has to do with the incisions in the thumb healing. But he, when we were out there on Monday, he wasn't practicing. He was in uniform with the stretching, but he was not practicing. When he was there last week, his arm was in a sling to stabilize, obviously, the wrist, et cetera. So we'll know more about him. On, on on Wednesday and then throughout the week. Then the unofficial depth chart came out on Tuesday. And on there, Dax Mill was listed as the number one kick and punt returner. No surprise there. I think Antonio Gibson will be used there on occasion. Maybe not when he's the full-time back, but when Brian Robinson comes back. And then also watch for Jahan Dotson at times to get some reps as a punt returner. And I, as I've told you before, the way they would do this is if there's a situation where they want or, or slash need a big return, let's say the Jaguars are kicking from their own end zone and the punter maybe has a tendency to line drive a punt. I don't know if that's the case, but let's say it is. Then they may stick Dotson back there, hoping that he could turn that into that field, that situation into a potential home run type play. Otherwise, it'll be Dax Mill. Finally, and then at Right guard, Trey Turner, was listed as the number one right guard. Well, Turner hasn't practiced in that role since early, the, like the first day or two of camp. Even since he's come back, that has not been where he's practiced. Wes Schweitzer has been that guy. So we'll see how that plays out as well. I think it'd be a good thing for Washington if Turner is healthy. I don't know. You know, we, we haven't seen him on the field with this team so or in a game. But they do have – it does give them depth because it puts Schweitzer as a backup but Schweitzer would be ready to go if something happens to Turner. So 
there you go. Now, a couple of programming notes. My son, Matthew, is doing a, a pod, excuse me, a video on YouTube called Inside the Hashes, where he does five minutes on the top college game of the week, makes a prediction. Also going to talk about some under the radar type games that you need to know about with a mini prediction and then taking you know, a few predictions on other games as well. So a, fit, a quick five minute video that will be worth your time. Then don't forget the All's Cap podcast hosted by Steve Wino and former Washington Capitol Carl Alsner. Another good one. Hockey season also is right around the corner. So give that a listen too. And finally, for me, I will be putting up a prediction on YouTube every weekend before leading into the game. So probably by Friday night or Saturday morning, give you a quick rundown on what my keys to the game are and who I think will win the game. Take it for what it's worth. I'm not always right. I've got a pretty decent record with this team, but sometimes early in the season, it is hard to figure things out. So it's not for betting purposes. It's just for entertainment. And so you can throw a figurative egg at me if I get it wrong. What I always enjoy is if you get it wrong, people remind you. If you get it right and they lose, then people don't come back to you. But the other part is sometimes like you'll hear, well, you didn't pick them to win this week. No, I didn't, but I picked them to win the last three weeks and they lost all those guys, games and nobody said anything. Anyway, it's for fun. Take it for what it's worth, but it will be up every weekend. And then finally, 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 Bram Weinstein and I will be, well, actually I'll be doing a live YouTube live show on Tuesday nights. I'll usually be joined by Bram Weinstein, the voice of the commanders, producer of the show, all around good guy and a host on ESPN 630. So we will be talking to you probably about for 30 to 40 minutes on Tuesday nights, answering some questions, looking ahead a little bit. It'll, it will be after we would have had a chance to rewatch the game. So there you go. That's what you need to know. Now, let's get to my interview with former Washington tight end, Logan Paulson. This episode is brought to you by Samsung. Unfold the all new Galaxy Z Fold 4 and expand your world. With flex mode, it stands on its own, so your hands free to get more done during calls. And with multi-window view, you can use up to three apps at the same time. Plus, the edge-to-edge -edge screen allows you to fully immerse yourself in your favorite games and shows. Visit Samsung.com to learn more about Galaxy Z Fold 4. The wait is almost over. A new football season is about to begin. Get ready for the NFL Week 1 action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. To celebrate the return of football, DraftKings is giving new customers a can't-miss offer. Bet just $5 on any football game and get $200 in free bets instantly. Want more action for opening night? Everyone can experience the thrill of DraftKings' early win promotion. Get up seven, you win! Bet on any NFL team of your choice, and if your team leads by seven points at any point during the game, you get paid instantly, even if your team loses. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code KIME to get $200 in free bets instantly when you place a $5 bet on any football game. That's code KIME, K-E-I-M. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 or older, Virginia only. Bonus issued as free bets. One early win token issued at opt-in. Moneyline bets only. Deposit and wagering restrictions apply. Eligibility and terms at DraftKings.com slash football terms. If you are someone you know has a gambling problem, call the Virginia Problem Gambling Helpline at 888-532-3500. Well, Logan, finally we can talk about a game. But I am curious, from a player's perspective, what is this week like leading into a season opener? How different does it feel for you when you're preparing for a game? That's the opener. Yeah, so I think that's a good question, obviously. I think the uh, the main thing is that the roster size is, is drastically decreased. You know, you go from having 90 guys around and the locker room feels crowded, everything feels a little bit tight, to just the – the kind of the nuts and bolts. And now obviously with the bigger practice squads, it isn't quite as drastic as it used to be, but um, it is a little bit different. The The feeling of the week is different. You're not doing as much like one versus one stuff in practice anymore. Your focus is kind of exclusively to Jacksonville. You've started watching film, the, your, your preparation, the meeting now feels more purposeful. Obviously training camp is purposeful and that you're installing and learning an offense, but now it's, 
it's you're sharpening the sword a little bit, right? Everything's kind of pointing towards what Jacksonville does, what I do on first and second down, what are our runs, what do we like, what are the looks they like to present. And so that's um, everything kind of ramps up a little bit. And I think the anticipation starts to build, which for a player is is always really exciting because it kind of helps you. It's a long season and it's nice to have this kind of delineation from the preseason into the regular season. That's what I was going to ask you too about that anticipation because like, is it, is it one where you get like these little, you know, butterflies at night of just like, I can't wait to get on the field. Is it, what's, what is that like? Yeah. So for me, I think it was probably a little bit different than most. I, I was a very anxious player, you know, and I would probably be up late kind of just be being reviewing the game plan to be like, Oh, you know, what if they run this blitz versus this run? And I'd have to get up and, kind of review the film and be like, okay, that's how they run it. This is the tell. And I'd make a little note. And then I tried to go back to sleep and I was always kind of obsessing about it. So it wasn't so much, uh, there was obviously excitement because you want to play games and stuff, but you also want to perform really well. And so I think there was a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of nervous energy towards that. Just kind of like the first day of training camp, how there's some nervous energy because it's like starting the process. It's the same thing with this, right? So you just want to make sure you're dialed in and feel ready to go. And I know um, like I said, it, like there was a little bit of anxiety, but there's also anticipation. So it's kind of like good and bad. And um, I know a lot of people handle it differently, but that was kind of my process. What about running on the field for the first time? Is there something different with that in an opener? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, one of the cool things about it, especially like when the fans are, are there is I, I was tell, I was tell, talking to my wife about this the other day is like when you run on, run from the tunnel to the field and you kind of feel the heat of the stadium, the energy of the stadium come up and the fans and the volume, and you get this kind of tingly adrenaline through your whole body. I mean, there's nothing quite like it, you know, like having, especially when you're in a, in a, in a, in a sold out stadium and everybody's kind of cheering for you. It's, um, you know, very few people in the world get to run out to 80,000 people screaming for, for your success. So um, very unique experience. Uh, one of a kind thing, John, if you ever have an opportunity, you should definitely give it a shot. I remember what it was like for way back when a few years ago in, in high school, but I don't, ha I don't think I'll get that chance for an NFL one anytime <laughs> soon. Um, although, you know, it's funny, Logan, I did have a dream like in the off season that some team wanted to sign me as a safety. I'm like, why would you want to sign me as a safety? Like I'm an old, I can't run anymore. Like, what are you doing? Um, but I didn't even run in the field in that dream. So I did, I was like, why are you signing? Why are you doing this? So, but that's how like, it gets to you like that. But um, and it probably right, has yeah. something to do with, yeah. Um, but anyway, enough about that. Um, well, how do you look at like, look at, let's look at this Jacksonville matchup. And you know, we were talking before mm. we came on here that you, I went back and watched some of their preseason games. You went and did that. What are some of the things that jumped out at you when just, just a little bit of insight you could get in watching some of their, their preseason games with the Stars? So I think, yeah, so I think that they're probably – the commanders are probably pretty fortunate because I think that um, the defensive coordinator, Caldwell, was in Tampa Bay, and obviously there's a huge uh, Todd Bowles influence on right. his philosophy. They didn't run a lot of blitzes in the preseason, but because of that connection, I'd expect to see a lot of pressure, especially in third and short situations, kind of got to have it situation. Todd Bowles likes to be that kind of guy, expecting to see that big kind of hulking front out there on first and second down kind of to, to kind of dissuade you from running the football ball I think in terms of defensive personnel they've got some guys now that are are very talented right they've got kind of inside they've got three carbon copies of the same player they're all six four they're all 320 and they're all designed to just eat up blocks and be nasty on first and second down you've got um uh, uh Trayvon Walker the first walk, pick yeah. in the yeah, first pick in the draft. And you see his tremendous athleticism and movement skills very very raw still but he is a very unique person to watch on film. And I'm excited to see what he does. Still a lot of growing to do for him, but very good player. John Allen, uh, John Allen, not John Allen. Josh. Allen, the, yeah, yeah, the uh, Josh Allen, or yeah, Josh Allen, that's right. He, he's an interesting guy also because he's he's kind of taken a long time to develop, but you see that pass rush ability that got him drafted in the first round. Uh, Foley, Foye Olakun, I played with him in Atlanta. He's one of the best middle best linebackers in the NFL, in my opinion, in terms of getting into the football and just having an athletic base to play some of these coverage philosophies. And so they have him. They have Muma, the kid from Wyoming that everyone wanted that want to draft right. here. They have Devin Lloyd, who was maybe my favorite defensive player in the draft. 
So they have some really, really talented pieces in the front. I think it falls down a little bit for them in the back end. But, you know, one of the things about Todd Bowles, he's able to elevate secondaries because of the pressure he's able to generate with the front. And then that's just on first and second down. Once you get into the nickel situations, one thing that really jumps out to me is they have great depth and a lot of guys who are maybe not the biggest or strongest guys, but guys who have very, very solid pass rush ability. So they get in these third and long situations and they get they, they trot out essentially four defensive ends and all those guys can win. So their ability to create pressure with the front four was was pretty exciting. Again, they're playing Pittsburgh and their offensive line of the last two years has been much maligned and, and probably a group that could do with some improvement but again that is something that every team in the nfl wants to get to is just having that ability to generate rush with the front four and they've got some guys maybe not household names but guys who can get that done great about walker and i saw him against the browns with a couple of rushes too and, and i think against sailors as well where he does he shows that rawness but can get inside and drive you back what is it that you saw from him as a, as a pass yeah. so i think it's the same thing you saw from him in college he is I mean, his there, there's a reason people covet length at the defensive end position. He has 35 inch arms, 35 and a half inch arms. He's 275 pounds, and his ability to touch the tackle before the tackle can touch him is very unique to him. You know, it's kind of a Montez sweat thing, but imagine Montez sweat if Montez weighed an extra 25 pounds. Mm -hmm. So his ability to get low, sink his hips, lift the tackle out of that position, it's it's kind of a cheat code in a lot of ways. And you can just tell if he gets that honed in and a counter move off of that, he's going to be unblockable. He's going to be the next like Alden Smith, the Marcus Ware caliber of player. He's not that guy just yet, but he is a fun, exciting, talented player. And just like in, when he drops into coverage, he looks like a defensive back. And so again, like you see why they took him with the first pick, obviously a lot of growing to do, but the length, the size, the speed, the bend, it's all there just about taking that ball of clay and molding it into, um, you know, an elite pass rusher. So what does is, what is Charles Leno do against a guy like that? Yeah, so I think it'll probably come down to Cosme, at least in the preseason game against Pittsburgh. Well, he, um, so Allen you saw, more, I saw him some on the right side, too. That's why. I, so go ahead. Yeah, so when the, when the starters came out, he bumped over to the defensive right, which would be Charles's left. So I got the, I got the impression, at least in the dress rehearsal portion of the game, that they wanted him rushing from the left and Allen okay. from the right. That could easily switch. Okay. Um, and I do think it's an interesting matchup. And I do think Cosme and Leno both are uniquely prepared for a guy like him because Montez Sweat is such a similar rusher. I think Montez doesn't rush with the same raw power that Trayvon Walker does, but the length issues, the speed, that kind of unique amalgamation of just like genetic upside, you know, they get to see that every day in Montez. So uh, I think that they're, they're going to be very, very qualified to handle a rusher like him. And obviously Montez gives those guys fits just because he's he's tall and he's long and he's got great power. And so, but I will say when in talking with Cosme and talking with Leno, seeing it every day helps you cultivate a plan to beat it. So I think that that's something that um, fans should feel good about is that those guys are going to be in a, good, in a good spot to be successful with that. And it's funny because like with Cosme, his first game last year was against Bosa with the Chargers, but Bosa rushes with a plan. And so I think he had a hard time with somebody who rushes with a plan. Whereas if you're not rushing with a plan and it's just, it, does it make it easier on a guy just because, you, you know, or because you're not sure if he's setting you up or anything, does it make it easier or is it a little bit harder because you're not sure what this guy's going to try? Right. So, you know, like I do, I coach some pass rushers in the off season who are in the right. NFL and like, I watch a lot of pass rushers as a result. And uh, Joey Bosa is, so fun to watch because he has every single move in his arsenal and he has he understands when to apply those moves the the right situations the right players to apply them to so in terms of of comparing pass rushers to me Joey Bosa's in terms of just being a, cl a clinician is top three in the NFL and like he is such a unique talent so for Cosme to be coming in against that in his first preseason game or his first oh. NFL start, excuse me, um, was he was behind the eight ball 100 percent. This is going to be drastically different. Now Cosme has that skill set, has those tools that that Bosa had last year going against him. And Trayvon Walker is the raw piece of clay um, that that he's going against. Right. So I think that that's the, the advantage here is definitely towards Cosme. He's seen NFL rushers he knows what they do and Trayvon Walker just doesn't have that same level of 
of polish and planning to him. And so if you can block the bull rush, I think you're going to be in a good spot. And Cosme's shown an ability to do that. Now, Trayvon Walker is unique, but I don't think it's unique enough to give Cosme fits. And so I think um, I think the thing where Trayvon Walker is going to really stand out early on in his career is off of these um, ET and TE stunts where the ends and tackles are switching rushers because he runs those with a violent physicality that is going to be very, very uh, fun to watch. And I think those guys definitely need to be on the same page or someone's going to get a, going to get an earful of a helmet and that's not going to feel very good. So looking at their offense, what'd you learn about their offense from those, from the little glimpses in the preseason? Right. Obviously it's, it's somewhat limited, you know, they're holding stuff close to the vest. It's, I think the offense in terms of the shot plays they want to do um, formationally, what they want to do, like they don't do a good job of marrying at least in the preseason um, they're running formations to their passing formations, So there's a pretty distinct delineation there. Um, shot plays are very similar to what Washington runs, which I think favors Washington in the communication and the type of defense that they run. So that's very encouraging. Um, and I think uh, the, the thing that really jumped out to me was two things. One was just how talented, absolutely talented Trevor Lawrence is. Yeah. I mean, he is a special football player. His arm talent, his ability to move in the pocket, um, you can tell he's got a little bit of Carson Wentz to his game with inaccuracy issues. The ball sail on him a little bit, but man, he is a special, special football player. If he can get it all figured out. The other thing that stuck out to me is just how, um, how inconsistent their offensive tackles are specifically yeah. Robinson and uh, Jawan, I think is his name. So both of those guys on the edge, they can, they, they, they're very talented athletes. You can tell, but, very inconsistent in how they set and their pass protection philosophy, um, which is a great juxtaposition to the interior of that group, which is very, very solid and consistent and created consistent movement um, in the run game. And you see why Brandon Sheriff's one of the best guards in the NFL. So um, yeah, I think that those are the things that really stuck out to me about their offense. I guess the other thing, if we're just talking things that stick out to you is they've totally over overhauled their skill position group. I right. think um, Travis, Travis Etienne is a very skilled runner. Um, I don't see the pass receiving ability that, you know, Urban Meyer was talking about last year, but I think they're a little bit behind in that regard. So it's hard for them to win one-on-one -on -one matchups. They really want Christian Kirk to go. I don't think he's quite, um, quite that elite like slot player. They, right. that, you know, when comparing him to like Hunter Renfro, for example. So um, I, it's going to be some tight windows for um, Trevor Lawrence. But he's shown an ability to make some of those throws and, Man, he is a he's a special football player. Um, very Andrew Luckian in terms of how he looks and performs on the field. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to see him in person out there, you know, on Sunday. I'll tell you that. With, with ETN, and one of the things um, I'm having our Jaguars beat reporter on podcast later in the week to talk about them. But in some of those games, one thing that, you know, I know he's like better between the tackles than people think. However, I also saw him tend to bounce yeah. outside a lot too. What did you, what was your take on him as a runner? Yeah. So I, I was actually impressed. I think, um, you know, he's a first round running back. He's obviously very talented. Um, yeah. You know, I didn't see kind of the top end explosion just because I don't think the opportunity was there, but the thing that did stick out to me is that, um, you know, Phil Rauscher, he was here for a long time. Yeah. He's the offensive line coach there. He kind of comes from that um, Bill Callahan tree of, of run philosophy. So a lot of gap stuff, you know, a lot of gap stuff. And then like, that's like counters and powers. And then uh, the perimeter stuff is kind of that, those like down blocks by the receivers and you pull right. the offensive line, very, very um, technical, you know? And uh, so as a result, Travis is running a lot inside the tackles. And I thought he did a really nice job with those opportunities in terms of creating something out of, limited space or finding the correct space and I was also really blown away by just how effectively that O-line did you know in terms of blocking those up you know they've got one of the best blocking tight ends in the NFL that shows up so I think um, I think that group is very talented and I think Etienne elevates that group he's still young you can tell but he's able to break some tackles and make people miss and I think like you said there is maybe a little bit of a bounce ability but I was very impressed with how he ran the ball between the tackles yeah he, 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 he was pretty tough runner in college too so when you look at like yeah. Carson Wentz, let's talk about the commanders. Right? We're looking at Carson Wentz and sure. the the big thing at the end of the year, obviously for him was the failure against the, in the against Jacksonville that last game to get the Colts to the playoffs. And it it certainly fed into you know the Colts narrative of why they want to get rid of him, whatever, whatever. How 
for a guy like Wentz to start off your next year with a new team against that opponent, I know they're different. It's a different situation. But sure. can this be good for him to go out and exercise that kind of ghost right away? I mean, I don't think it totally matters. And I think part of the reason I feel that way is because defensively, it's it's almost a completely new group. You know, like there's very few people carrying over defensive philosophies. I want to stay completely different. Um, obviously, the head coach is different. That I think that's maybe more of a motivator here, like because Doug Peterson knows Carson Wentz pretty intimately and is going to be able to stress him. So, uh, you know, I don't think I don't I don't think the name on the jersey means anything to Carson, or you know, if it it shouldn't, in my opinion, because it's such such a different team. Uh, but you know, I think I think the the most important thing is getting a win against a winnable opponent or uh, an opponent that's slightly um, less less dynamic than you are. So I think right. that's maybe the, the most important thing. I don't think it matters that it's Jacksonville. I don't think it matters that he lost to them last year. Um, it matters about getting a win against a team that I think a lot of people are sleeping on, but after watching them, like, I think there's, there, there's a lot of young talent on the roster and it's one of those teams that makes you nervous because they can punch up, you know, having a guy like Trevor Lawrence on the roster and his arm talent, having a defense that's fast and physical and young like that, it makes you nervous that they could kind of get into a turnover. They could, um, you know, maybe hit a deep pass for a touchdown. And then all of a sudden they're kind of in the ball game. So, you know, a game that I think a lot of fans are chalking up as a for sure win um, after watching them in preseason, at least I don't, I'm less confident. I think it's going to be a very competitive matchup, especially early on. On a beautiful run through the park on a pleasant day, you can easily get lost. No, no, no. She didn't kill him. Huh? in your true crime podcast. It was the pool guy, so obvious. Whatever motivates you works for us. It's all about letting your run be your run. And Brooks is here for every runner, doing the research and sweating the details to create gear that works for you. It's your run. Brooks, run happy. This episode is brought to you by Tostitos, the official chip and dip of the NFL. From tailgating to wearing the same socks every game day, everyone has their own way of supporting their team. And now, you can show your support even more with Tostitos. Get their delicious restaurant-style tortilla chips and unique packaging for almost any NFL team. But they're only available for a limited time while supplies last. So hurry to get your local Tostitos team bag at a store near you. Learn more at Tostitos.com. And you're right about Carson. I think that's probably more of a narrative surrounding him versus a, as Ron always right. said, what's interesting versus what's important. And it's really not important <laughs> because, and, you know, and, but I know like it becomes a narrative for him. Um, what, what, watching him throughout the preseason, throughout camp, what, what did you think? Of Carson? I yes. think, you know, I think Carson is. You know, we've talked about him a lot over the course of the last two months. And I think um, I think he's a solid football player, but solid football players need to be insulated by personnel. They need to be insulated by play calling and they need to be insulated by good defense. And I think that's the thing about Carson that is um, kind of somewhat, uh, you know, unnerving, I think, at the, at the moment is he's got the talent. He's got the intellect. It's just it doesn't always co co connect. And then as a result of that lack of connection, you need to make sure that other things on the roster are supporting him. So I think that that's I think that's what we kind of glean from his time in Indianapolis. I think that's what we glean from his time during uh, mini camp and training camp. And so I think now it's about seeing what the plan is to keep him insulated uh, by Scott Turner, you know, by the defense and can they kind of put him in the best position to be successful? Because he's not a guy who can just kind of go out there and win football games on his own. He needs some type of support system. And I think the support system here is at the moment unproven because they haven't played any games yet. And and that's right. And, I, you know, I, I, I like the potential of this offense with all that. But one thing, too, we haven't seen what they're going to do. And we were hurt. We would hear like right. – Oh, we're not going to do anything until you guys aren't able to watch us, meaning, you know, the media. How much do you think they've already put in? Like, because again, they're not showing us a lot in practice. We're, we were able to watch every practice up until a week ago. So when, how, what's the process of installing 
what they're going to do in the season. Like, are they going through it during walkthroughs and then install it and going running, you know, doing it live when we're not there? What would that process be like? Right. So I think, you know, everyone is pretty familiar with the installation process. Like they kind of go through their 10 days of install and then your offense is in. But each week you kind of you tweak that 10 that 10 day install to kind of fit your opponent. Right. You kind of say versus um versus west slot so two tight ends to the right attached versus two slot receivers to the left they line up in this very specific way so what concepts can we run to take advantage of that and how can we formation to get our best people in the best position to be successful and that's when you start game planning right you look for tells and consistencies within the defense things that people um you know, kind of like ten- tendencies, like the, the defensive coordinator on third down, he likes to run this blitz. So what do we call here to put ourselves in the best situation to be successful? It's still coming from the 10 day install, but formationally personnel wise, maybe even some timing things are kind of tweaked to fit the opponent for that week. And that stuff's all going to be going in now. Right? right. And so I think when fans say, Oh, like, well, why didn't they practice the stuff they're going to run? They were practicing the stuff they're going to run. They're just not practicing exactly how they're going to run it against Jacksonville. And then when they're playing, um, who are, they're playing Detroit the following week, there'll be a couple tweaks there too. And so you, you got to like kind of learn, it's not learning a new offense because the offense is in place, but it's learning how this offense will be executed against Detroit. And I think that's kind of where they're at now. And, um, and it'll be interesting to see what they end up, coming out with you know because like you said we haven't been able to watch that uh with any right. kind of regular regularity are you like i think the fact that curtis samuel gets through camp healthy is a big deal for them because of the versatility he has what do you what do you think about what he can do and the impact not that he's going to be their best player but just i think his presence provides an impact how much can he help and i mean do, do you agree with that yeah, so I think there's a couple things to look at there. One is, especially with the injury to Brian Robinson, his <clears throat> excuse me, his role becomes a lot more significant because you can line him up as a running back, right? And I'm not saying that that's the only way he should be utilized, but he's also this type of player that I think is very unique in that they create mismatch issues. They create right. personnel conundrums for the defense. And so even though he might not have a 1,000 yards receiving this year, if he's deployed effectively, he can – put you in the best situation for Carson to kind of read and understand what the defense is doing. He can give you tells, he can give you easy completions. He can get you extra yards in terms of yards after catch on screens and short dump off routes. He can be an excellent slot receiver. So I think that's where his value is, right? In terms of if Scott Turner knows how to utilize that chess piece, it can kind of help tip the defense's hand. And if the defense's hand is tipped, it allows Carson to play, you know, a second, a tenth of a second faster. And that is super, super relevant to having a successful season for Carson Wentz. Is that by motion, alignment, both? Yeah, yeah. motion, alignment, both, personnel. It gives you some flexibility, you know, like you can, like we've talked about before, you could be in, um, you know, essentially four wide receivers with JD in the backfield. And then you could run some type of switch motion where all of a sudden Samuel's now in the backfield and, and JD's in the slot. And you can kind of dictate. Now the defense says, oh, man, we weren't expecting this type of shift. How do we adjust? And you all of a sudden put the defense on their heels. And just using that personnel flexibility, I think, is going to be really important. Um, and I think, yeah, so it's it's multifactorial. It's, you know, alignment. It's motions. It's, um, you know, packaging plays for him. All those things are going to be really relevant in terms of bringing the best out of him. Was there an overreaction to the Gibson fumble? And what do you expect from him now? Um, you know, I kind of think there was a little bit of an overreaction. I think part of it was because it, it, there was a fumble. And then I think, you know, Brian Robinson started taking all the carries. But at least like being around the building every day, like I felt like that was something they wanted to do anyway. I felt like the writing was on the wall there. Okay. Um, so I, I do think that was a slight overreaction. I mean, it, so that that's the overreaction. I think Gibson's a good football player. I think he's going to be a part of this team. I think he's going to contribute to this team. But I, 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 I do think he's got to hold on to the football, too. I think yes. that's another thing that – Kind of a big deal. Um, you know, yeah, it's, I mean, it's the most important thing. Like, um, you know, Bobby Turner used to say ball security is job security and do like a 10-minute presentation at the start of every training camp about how to hold on to the football. And, and why it was so important. You know, you have the lives, I remember still to this day, you have the lives of my family, your family, everyone's family in the organization in your hands, like treated as such. 
And, um, you know, obviously, like, when I see the ball on the ground, it gives me anxiety because I just think about Bobby Turner freaking out about it. So, obviously, he needs to hold on to the football. And I think that um, that is not an overreaction because he has not seemingly corrected an issue that was very prevalent last year, which causes you to lose football games. Right. Turning over the football causes you to lose football games. So, yes, I think – the the reaction that oh we need to cut him he's terrible all that that's an overreaction correct I a thousand percent agree yeah and and that's like I still think he's going to be a good player because, but I'm curious to see yeah. how he's used as well because he does offer some versatility and you can you can you know just like what you talked about with Curtis and J D McKissick some of the switch motion you one of his big runs against Dallas two years ago comes out of the slot if you remember that they had that yeah. forty one yard run out yeah. of basically out of the slot so you can do some different things with him to to tap into his explosiveness i think so i still think he sure. can have a, i still think he can have a good year do you have more questions about the offense or the defense at this point i think um i kind of feel like i know who the defense i know the defense and i know who they want to be and i feel like they're just a couple very subtle execution points away from being good I think offensively, I have more questions because there's they've, they've kept all their kind of game plan coast of the vest, which they should do. How is Carson going to truly execute this offense when the bullets are real? What is Gibson going to be like now that he's kind of back in the in the starting role? Are they going to utilize him that same way? Because we've talked about this too. Like one of the things about Brian Robinson that was great is he just kept you on schedule. Right. Gibson is not that style of runner. I mean, he's he's got the home run abilities there, but in terms of consistently executing offense – that's not there. You know, what's the tight end room going to shake out like? You know, the guys are getting healthy. Like, what is that utilization package going to be? Um, and then how are they going to utilize Jahan and 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 get the most out of his skill set? He's been outstanding in camp. Yeah. I want to I want to see that against real defenses. So um, so I think I think that's the thing that kind of sticks out to me. I just feel like there's more questions within the context of the offense. I think the defense is closer than people think and i think they're playing better than people think and i think um the as a result like i'm less concerned about that group and i'm more concerned about the offense and the direction that's going to go so that's interesting to me because i i can't, i i wondered i have still have some questions about them so what what is it that you saw that made that says that about the defense and how they they're closer and playing better yeah so i think the thing that stuck out to me probably most dramatically was in the back end and it was just like you know, last year through camp, through the preseason, um, there were free runners all over the place. Yes. Guys just running wide open and mental, obvious mental mistakes. And that issue seems to be clear to, to be corrected. And so if you look at the kind of trajectory of last season, they struggled early on because they had coverage busts. Right. right. And once those coverage busts started to decrease, which I kind of look as the New Orleans game is the delineation of that or the marker of that, um, they started playing better. So I think they've kind of carried the second half of that season into this offseason. I think Curl, McCain, um, all those guys are, are are communicating and playing at a very high level. And that just gives me confidence that they, they're going to continue to do that. And when I watched them against Kansas City, they did a really fantastic job of matching concepts. And I think fans failed to understand in that Kansas City game, Kansas City, that offense has been together for a while, and they run routes – to beat coverages. And I, I think I've talked to you about this, but like they run a scissors concept. So right. post by number one, corner by number two, and the way the coverage is designed, the way it is on paper, they have that concept covered. But instead of running a corner, Travis Kelsey says, oh, I see it's quarters. I'm just going to sit down. And that's not at any coach. No coach told him to do that. He's just playing street ball, get open by the mailbox. And that's what makes him and Matt Patrick Mahomes so special. But I say, yeah. Right. And so that I think that so when you look at that, you say like, oh, that's a bust. That's, that should have been a completed pass. I look at it the other way. It said they had they had they matched the concept correctly. And then they're playing outside of the concept. I'm talking about Kansas City. Right. And and that's why it's completed. So against a lesser team, against a lesser connection in terms of chemistry, like that's going to be an incomplete pass or an interception. And so I look at that and then I look at how well Kendall Fuller played in that game. Was good. And so to me. Yeah, so to me, I think the issue is more on the rush at the moment and just making sure you're doing your job and you're staying home and you're keeping the quarterback in the pocket, which is going to be an issue against Jacksonville. But again, like that to me is the bigger question mark at the moment. Can those guys just be disciplined down in and down out and allow the coverage to be put in a good situation and be successful? So 
Um, that's why that's why I'm encouraged because I think the rush stuff is easily easily fixed. They've got a new defensive line coach, you know, over the last 10 days. So can they get those guys right? I've heard about Ryan Kerrigan's impact on the room already. That's just going to get better as we go. So heard? I feel like they're in a better spot. I'm sorry. I, didn't I heard hear that he's just been – no, I've heard that he's just been a true – like as he was a, a professional football player who went to multiple Pro Bowls, that's how he's been as a coach. Detail oriented, getting guys ready, providing nuanced insight on pass rush. And like that's what you expect from a guy like that. He's been that way his entire life, every single day that I've known him. So it's great to see that that's just continued to, to you know, his coaching career. I'll be I'll be honest. I've been shocked that they haven't had a guy like that in there in that room helping to coach because it just it's pass rushing is a unique skill. And I think it's whether you have the yeah. veteran pass rusher to help with them or a coach who has that. So I, that can be a big help to those, like a guy like sweat. Right. Right. I, I think a hundred percent, I think, and especially because they're kind of similar rushers and people say, what do you mean? They're similar rushers. They both use like Ryan Kerrigan had like one move and it was the long arm and he perfected it. And he understood how to set it up so that he could hit that ball out of the park. And so now taking a guy who has who's done it at a high level for a long time and saying, hey, Montez, these are some things that I used to do to set this move up and make sure it was effective. Like that's invaluable. And Montez has said as much, you know what I mean? Like he told me in, a, in one of the sideline interviews, it's just been great to have him around because he knows like he's he's he's, he's done that move. Ryan, I'm talking about probably thousands, tens of thousands of times. And so now to be able to apply all of that data to Montez, I think is, is extremely valuable. And it's the same move. They run the same move. So um, I think it's great. It's going to really help Montez out. I think a um, couple more minutes uh, expectations for the season, for this group, for, for the team. Yeah, I think it's tough because, you know, like I said, one of my bigger questions is on the offensive side of the football. I think the defense will be fine. I think they'll probably finish in the top 15, nothing crazy, but you don't need crazy good defenses to be good in the NFL. You need crazy right. good offenses. And you I think turnovers. this offense can, yeah, yeah, you need you need a way to, um, you know, you just need to be competitive on defense, which I think they will be. And I think the offense is the thing that carries you. Like, that's NFL football in 2022. And can this offense do that? I think that that remains to be seen. I think the pieces are there, like we've talked about. You've got a new quarterback. The offensive line's playing well. Can they become a top-10 offense? Because if they can, they're going to be a pretty dang good football team. And I think they'll be a for sure 10-win team. The question is, if the offense struggles, if they flounder, if they're not doing a good job, if they're not taking care of the football, it could easily be five wins. And I know that sounds like a huge range, but that's the level of variance you get from a guy like Carson, right? Is is it's His up is very up. His down is very down. And so where does it fall in between there? Do you look at this um, as almost like, how important, last question, how important is it for them to get off it's always important to get off to a good start, but when you've had when it's year three of a program and you are opening up with, there's no easy wins in the NFL, but you are opening up with two teams right. who's coming off a tough year. How important is this for this team to, to get off to a good start this year? It might be a silly question, but it, I think it's very important. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's important, you know, and it, it's important because the expectation is that these teams are powder puffs and they should crush them. But I don't, like you said, there's no easy wins. And like we've talked about Jacksonville's evolution over this offseason. I bet you Detroit's a better football team this year. Right. They need to win these two games, but they're not going to be easy. So I think that that is, um, and, and I think the other reason it's important they win is because the fan expectation right. is that they win. And so that to me is another reason why they become really important. Because if they lose, then the fans and the whole community, the media, everyone loses their minds. How many times have we seen, John, you've been in the NFL for, for forever how many times have you seen a team start slow turn it around week three and then they look like you know they win 10 games Correct. of the last 15 right it, or they or it, they win their first two and then go three and they you go you know four and 12 or something like that yeah seen that too absolutely and that's part of why this is like kind of a like is it important yes but it's more important from like a perception standpoint and you know maybe they they lose some close games here early on but it teaches them something about themselves and they go beat Philly and they go beat Dallas. And then do I really care that much about these two games? Not really. You know what I mean? Like it becomes less important. They are this Rivera's teams seem to get better, but they also can start slow 
is this group is the coaching staff sometimes slow to adjust or what do you think is a reason for that uh i think part of it i think part of it is just their off-season process i think a little bit too like it, it doesn't lend itself necessarily to starting fast like um you know when you're not running the stuff you're planning on running early on in the season from a blitz standpoint like i did that video breakdown with ron last week and he was right. talking about how montez sweat lined up two feet too wide and how it made the blitz late like right. you don't get those reps unless you run them you know and like and like they need to do it more i think earlier in the off season to know to get some of that stuff cleaned up but um that's not to say they're going to start slow but i think that's some of the reason as to why potentially they do start slow logan you're the best um let people know where they can find you i know it's not on twitter but so let them know <laughs> uh yeah you can find me on instagram logan underscore paulson 82 post a lot of my content on there and then obviously I have the Take Command podcast, which, um, you know, is a lot of these very similar conversations right. to what John and I have on here. So if you want more of that content, great. And then I also do the um, the stuff with Julie on NBC Sports Washington. So please check that out or check out the YouTube channel for that stuff. All over the place and always, always great insight. Logan, thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it, man. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Logan for joining me. And thank you, as always, for listening. I'll be back on Thursday night with Jacksonville Jaguars beat reporter Michael DiRocco with ESPN. We're going to dive more into the game, get you ready for the first game of the season. Talk to you next time.